I know you miss your friends, but... Okay, so um, we're talking about process state, right? So what has to happen is, anytime in the OS, someone requests that a process is created, that means that some process will have to be created from some code that exists on hard disk. Maybe you bought um, a new program, some new software, or you wrote it yourself and compiled, and you want to run. Right. That means that before it runs, the operating system has to be told that something new is coming in. Right. And in, in, before it makes it ready, it means that it has to get the code for that program, put it into memory, prepare its program control block. So last time we said that every process that is on the system has a process control block. That contains information about it, such as its PID, its permissions, the resources it has. So all of that goes into the process of making a new process ready. Just as if you had a new student before they show up, we'll have to get all their papers together. Are they traveling? Where are they going to live? That's like their space. Um, what books do they need? Do they need a phone? Do they need meals? Everything about them has to be ready. So from new to ready, that's what it's going to happen. But when we finally say someone is ready, that means we've got their process control block. And we have also prepared their memory. So the memory, that means we we'll put, so the text here represents the actual program, right? The data is usually the static information. So if you write Java, you can say static, static. All of those are not key points stack, but they are variables that will exist before you start, right? And then as the program is running, you need a stack and a heap, and that's the program will grow by itself. But basic, you need the text and you need its core data, right? And that means that a process can be put into a queue of, or a list of things that are ready. So from the list of things that are ready, some of them are going to be picked up regularly to run on the CPU, right? And so from ready to CPU, that's running means that you're on the CPU. From ready to CPU, and today I'll add what we are discussing is, the short-term scheduler is the person who decides very quickly. So there are many types of schedulers. The short-term scheduler is the one who decides who gets to run on the CPU. So every time a program switches in and out of the CPU, there's a scheduler that is going through checking how long do you run, do you have permissions to run this long, should we allow someone else to run. So there's a, just a, a program that's going through scheduling people. Right? And you can see there's also an interrupt, meaning that any time an interrupt occurs, whether by disk or some other process somewhere, you will have to be what, taken off the CPU so that the OS can come in and handle the request. That's why the interrupt is triggering a transition from running back to ready. So anytime an interrupt happens, you're going to move off. Does anyone remember what is going to happen when the OS comes into the CPU? What are some of the things it has to do? So assuming it has loaded off the other, loaded off the, the process that was running, has come to the CPU, what does it need to do so that it doesn't get interrupted? So it's in chapter one or two. It has to work. Not just switch the processes. The moment he comes in, he has to prevent people from interrupting him. So he's going to turn interrupts off. You may have read that in chapter one or two. Turning interrupts off. So that's a privilege or an instruction. That's some, what he will do. So once he comes in, he has to make sure that what he gets to finish his job. Right? So what he'll do is he'll turn off interrupts so he doesn't get interrupted, do his work. But when he's leaving, or she's leaving, don't know, you haven't assigned gender yet. When the OS kernel is leaving the CPU, it's going to what? You remember switching the modes? When he comes in, he comes in with kernel mode. When he's leaving, he leaves as user mode. And also turns the interrupts back on. So that if someone else is running apart from the kernel, it can be interrupted and taken off. Right. So you can see that even in terms of system calls, if a program is able to disable even one thing, it's, it's going to be very difficult for the operating system. So imagine if, let's say, some program, even if you love the program, you are playing a movie, and all of a sudden that, that program was allowed to disable interrupts, meaning that what? It will run forever. Nobody can stop it, unless maybe physically you turn off the machine. So interrupts are good, but it also can be dangerous. So for the OS that is in there, he has to use what? Enable and disable interrupts. So when he comes, you disable it, so that he doesn't get interrupted or she doesn't get interrupted while it's running. So throughout the process, you also have the waiting list. So people may request for resources from the OS. 
Maybe you want more memory, you want a device, you want a file. A lot of requests that you make, you may have to join a waiting list. It may be very quick. So if you have a program and you open a file, it's something that's done very quickly. You don't really, you don't see a slowdown. But the CPU is running so quickly that for most humans, we don't see any slowdown. The only time you see a slowdown is sometimes when one program has it and another wants it. So maybe you're opening a spreadsheet and it's open somewhere else. Then it will stop and ask you, this has already been opened. Do you want to create a copy? Or sometimes if the program wasn't smart, it would just hang. You can try that as well. So for those who have Java programs, you can open a program or a file in maybe Excel and write your Java program to open that file. What will happen is while the program is still open in Excel or Windows Word or something, your Java program will just go there and hang. Or sometimes it will just throw an exception, say so it couldn't open. So those are the things that has to happen. Right? So the OS has to manage all the resources. So anytime someone asks for a resource and asks for a waiting list, the person is going to move from running to what? Waiting. And when the resource becomes available, or if there's an error, your process control block thank you, would be updated, and then what? You'll be set to ready. Ready means that you now have your resource you can run. And then when you run, eventually, hopefully, you will get to terminate it, meaning you are finished, you are finished running. Right. So this is an overview of the states of processes. Right. By this time, it should be somewhere in your heart. Okay, so sometimes someone is asking what happens when you think the file is not being opened, but still the, the operating system or there's an error telling you the file is already open. Now, sometimes there may be other things that are holding onto the file that you are not aware of. Right. So um, the one I've seen, at least last week, I saw an antivirus that had opened a file or a folder on my pen drive. And for that reason, that you can close everything, but it still refuses to re release it. Right. And that is it's good for protection. That means the OS is making sure, still keeping track. So it's not every program that um, is running that you see has a window that you can click. Right? So some other program might actually have a hold on it. If the program is killed or if the, the program terminates, it will release it. But that means that someone in there, some process, has a hold. Right? So at the end of the class, um, just remind me, I'll just show you quickly with um, Process Explorer in Windows how you can find who is, who is holding your file. There's, there's a way to search and find which program is holding your file. OK, so any other question on this before we move? Okay, so the question is, how does the OS decide which program to run? Right. So in this chapter, we just assume that the scheduler is doing that job. In chapter 6, that will come up a little bit later, we'll talk about the different types of schedules. So some of them will be first come, first served, such as the OS knows uh, this program came first. Even though you clicked, there is going to be some millimicrosecond separating them. Right. Or even in insertion, someone has to go in before the other, because it's, it's a program that is building it. So if it's first come, first served, then it will use that rule. If it is shortest job first, you use that rule. If it is the longest job first, that rule. Priority. So there are, there are quite a few, or even round robin. Round robin is um, almost like passing around so everyone gets a share of the time. So everyone gets some time. So depending on the sort of the policy for scheduling, you will use that to pick one. So it may seem like two things want to run, but one will always go before the other. Except maybe you have a multiple core system, but then you will know that, oh, I have three cores or four cores to schedule, and there are four things I can put different ones in different positions. Okay, so let me add on um, the bits that are coming in for today so we can understand the entire life cycle. So going from new to ready, there is a long-term scheduler, which if you read in a text, is also called a job scheduler. Meaning that when jobs come in, there has to be someone that schedules them. It's just like us, uh, we use admissions a lot.
for example. So admissions, these are the people. So before even you get on campus and the registrar decides which course you go into and where you go and all of that. Before that, there's somebody that has to pick which processes should even be made ready and get them ready. Right. So there's a long-term scheduler. So it's like, I know the words are a little bit uh, short-term, long-term. It's not a good description, but long-term scheduler or a job scheduler who deciding on, or depending on the requests that have come in, which process you want to run, will decide who has to be picked to be made ready. Right. So for example, if you are putting up your operating system, the operating system is starting, there are certain processes that have to run. Right. And it's the job of someone to decide, well, the operating system is starting. Should you immediately worry about getting Internet Explorer ready or Firefox? Maybe not, because there may be other processes that have to be loaded before that one. So there are some, there is a long-term or job scheduler that prepares the jobs to make them ready. So from new to ready, there is the long-term or job scheduler. So that's one type of scheduling, deciding. So I hope you understand the, is it the logistics? It's just like operations, logistical operations. Like something has to be made ready. There has to be someone or something that is scheduling that process. That of all the requests coming in, which ones do we pick to make ready? Are people understanding that? Just like in daily life. So is it like, just to bring you turn on the computer, so mm -hmm. is it like um, your startup options where you have um, high, medium, and low? Okay, so maybe you're talking about the task manager, where you write it and say high, medium. That one is with respect to the short-term scheduler. That is with the CPU running right now. Right. So what I'm talking about long-term scheduler, for example, let's say we all go to the canteen to order food. Right. And then we all ask for different things. Some people want to eat fried plantain, fufu, bangkun, to so on. Right. All these requests are going to come in. But at that point, Someone has to decide in what order are we going to serve this, right? How do we even start preparing? So even in the preparation process, there has to be some scheduler who decides, okay, there are all these orders that have come in. Maybe at the restaurant, we see this, was, um, not saying that our canteen food is not fresh, but there are some restaurants where when you get there, they are, they are going to prepare the food. So someone comes and makes an order. There's rice, there's stir fry, there's bakun, mutu. Someone has to decide very quickly, which ones do we start preparing? Right. It's not yet ready. These are requests that have come in. So that one is called the long-term schedule. Which one do we start preparing to be ready? Right. That is what we mean by long-term schedule or job schedule. Right. Or in the case of, as I said, I mentioned someone has to come in and say, which students are we going to start preparing? Should we prepare maybe those who are already living in, in the country? Or should we uh, maybe travel to some region and, and bring them in to make them ready? So there's some scheduling in bringing people from new to ready. There's some scheduling involved in all processes. Or even if you're a company and you are sitting there in the morning and you get 100 phone calls, I'm sure that even though the, the calls are coming in in some sequence, you have to sit down and ask, which ones am I going to prepare for? Or even which ones am I going to look at? Because there are some companies where they get requests, or so even applications. They have to even decide, how do we even go through this? Do we maybe take, or oh, is it the ones that we know we can do best? Do we take those ones? Should we go for the one with the biggest money? attached to it? Or should we go with the ones that are attached to friends and family so they don't get angry at us? Or should we go with the ones attached to maybe strangers? Because maybe strangers are people who, well, they won't forgive us if we are late. Right. So whatever the case, when a request comes in, something, there has to be some policy to decide which one are you going to get ready first. Right. So that is the long-term schedule. The short-term schedule, so with the job situation, the short-term schedule is now you've got all these jobs ready. Maybe you have prepared their case files. How do you what, pick what you are working on? So some of it might be, so shortest job fair. Someone could say, well, let me, and some people study this way. Let me study the easiest first, the hardest later. Some people would say, well, let me study the hardest things first. Or maybe you could be cycling between computer programming and writing. So you write a bit, and then you go back to coding a bit. You write a bit, you go to coding a bit. So that is your, what? Your short-term schedule. So on the short-term, the next thing, what are you going to do next? The things are already, what are you doing next? That is the short-term schedule. So I would say in the long-term field, we're moving from a new to ready. To ready, and yes. short-term ready to run. Ready to run. So those are the main things. A request has come in, how do you even decide 
which one to start preparing for. You're a lawyer, someone has bought a case, or many cases. Somehow, you have to prepare these documents to go and look up, ask questions, how much money, who is the client, where does he live, what is the case, where is the police docket, and all of that. That's some preparation. So even when all the cases come, you have to decide which one am I going to prepare for. But once the cases are also prepared, put into folders, that is your program has in memory, these are the things I need to run. You have to what? Be switching. Because in real life, I'm sure most of you are taking four or five classes. Every day, at the end of the day, after lunch or maybe after dinner, you have to sit down and ask yourself, what am I going to tackle first? Should I maybe start deciding the things I need for my assignment? Or even in what order? Maybe you are afraid of a certain lecturer or you love a lecturer so much, you want to prepare for that lecturer first. But after all that preparation, where you've gathered your material, I need to write an essay. Here are my books. So that it's ready to go. I need to write a program. Here, I've downloaded the dead beans. I've installed my libraries. I've got my description. Okay, it's ready now. But after that, you also have to decide what. How are you going to be handling those? Are you going to do one for one minute, do one for two minutes, one hour, one hour, 30 minutes? That is what your short-term schedule. Right. Now, along the line, you will be, maybe, go and look for something. You will have to get some other resource. That means that that task is waiting. Right. And until that resource comes, so you being the controller, until that resource comes, maybe you could shelve it. I need a book from the library. I haven't got it yet, so I'm going to shelve it. But once the book comes, you move it from the waiting list back into your ready queue. You could maybe decide immediately it's ready, move it back to running. But there is, in most things that human beings do, this cycle, except that in operating systems, it has been what, coded so that it happens in an automatic and consistent way. But the way operating systems were designed is the same way that human beings, we tend to think. Somewhere in your mind, you are doing this. Right. Okay, so between, um, there's one last scheduler, right? The last scheduler involved is the medium term scheduler. I know the wording that they used wasn't nice, like long, medium, short. But medium term just means if you have memory. So kind I have, I think it's 16 gigabytes. If you have memory and things are running, now and then you have to decide the things that are going to go back to what? The hard disk. Because sometimes you'll be having too many things. So you're coming to class, you have a, a backpack. Somehow you have to decide of the things that are ready and you're going with. Sometimes something is ready, but what? You don't want to use it today. Maybe there's an essay you need to write, but it's due maybe two weeks from now. You could leave those books out of your bag. Just say, okay, this is not in my memory right now. I'm going to put them aside. So if the things, if the tasks become many, you will what? Have to start swapping the things that are on you. I hope you're understanding that task. Right? Because I'm sure all of you are doing it well. Hopefully more than two classes. If you have just one class, it's so sweet. You just, everything is in the bag. You have your textbook, your laptop, or maybe your tablet, your phone, or your notebook. You, everything is in the bag. You can go around. Right? But the moment the tasks become many, right? maybe there's two classes, three classes, four classes, and the classes I give you homework, projects, all these things. After a while, you would not put everything in your bag. Sometime before the day starts, or even during the day, you sit down and say, what things do I really need? You move them and put them down. I mean, out of your memory. Put them aside into hard disk. And then work on a few things that you think are priority. And then now and then, go and swap out. Right? So there's a swapping process between memory and hard disk. For even those that are ready. Because there are many programs that are coming. Many, many programs. So just like human beings, now and then, ask look through and ask, can I handle everything in memory? If not, what? Take some, leave them on the hard disk. Work on the ones that are in memory. So that task is the medium term memory. Oh, sorry, medium term scheduler. So that's the, um, is that when, does that only occur when RAM is limited? It occurs whenever RAM is limited. I mean, you can make a scheduler that um, to put things into memory even when there's space. I don't know why anyone would do that because usually cost the CPU power to move things around, power and time. So, and it won't just start pushing things onto the hard disk, right? Because it's better if you have all the space. That's why I asked. It's like if you have, let's say you have a, a phone or a computer, and you know that everything will fit on it. Maybe you have one terabyte of storage. You won't worry about it. You just be kind. 
But the moment you realize, okay, I have only one gig, or some, it's happening to some people now. They have maybe 50 gigabytes. They have Windows occupying a certain part of Linux occupying a part. And they have only about three gigabytes left. Somehow they have to make a decision. Do I copy this and put it on an external hard drive? Leave it. Or should I kindly keep it in so I can work with it? So that is the medium term schedule. I'm trying to decide, okay, I have space. But some people too can say, oh, well, I would like to have some space on my drive anyway. So it all depends on how the OS was designed. That is it designed even to say, okay, should I always make sure I have some space around just in case a request comes in? Right. So that's just a design choice. So when you're back from the address, you get the new to Okay, so remember that they were ready to begin with. So those who are going back to hard disk, the people who are ready to run, except we didn't. So when they come back, they are going to go back to the ready list. Right? It's not that they have to be new. Um, but for some operating systems, so I've seen this with some of the mobile devices. Now and then, I think you'd see this um, in the options, uh, maybe some of the settings. It will ask you um, how many processes do you want to keep. And you'd say maybe five. Some operating systems for the mobile have that option. Because the mobile device has very well, compared to a laptop, little space, little RAM, little power. So by itself, for it, it's a good strategy. Knowing that mobile devices, people tend to, they use it, they put it back in their pocket. For them, it's a good strategy to say, well, I don't see you using these things. I'm going to close them and put them on the screen. Right. So depending on the OS or even how it's being used, different strategies are going to be put into play. Where it wouldn't even be, someone is asking, anytime it comes back from disk, does it mean that it's coming back to new? For some operating systems, when you see you are not using a process for a while, it would actually, what, kill it off and send it back into memory and say, well, when you are ready, you can start it. Because for a mobile device, for example, has what? Little memory. If it were important to you, it's something you'd be referring to constantly. So it would be in memory for a lot. But if it's something you have opened and have not touched for a while, if it keeps it in memory or it keeps running it, it could what? Just drain battery and so on. So if it determines, oh, you have not used it for a while, for some of the mobile devices, the strategy is kill it. Not even just send it to memory, just stop the process. And when you ask for it, then we'll have to load it again, starting from new. Right. So it's a strategy of different OSs. But Windows, Linux, currently the, the big formats on laptop and so on, they tend to just what, swap them. If they take the whole ready process, put it on a hard disk, and when you're ready, they'll bring it back. Oh, from new to ready. From new, you never go straight to uh, waiting. You go to ready. The ready is anybody who is ready to run. So in ready to, you do some waiting, right? But ready, ready means the difference between ready state and waiting state. In the ready state, you have everything you need that if you are called to be put into the CPU, you can run. Whilst in the waiting state, there is a resource that you are waiting for. And that is why you are in the waiting state. Maybe you open the file or you want to play some music. But the OS hasn't given you the permission, so go ahead. So in that case, you are not ready, but you are going to be waiting in the waiting state. But anybody in the ready state can actually run the moment he's what? Given the CPU. I hope that is understandable. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the medium scheduler isn't in this diagram, right? But if I were to add it, I'll put it from, sorry, from ready to disk. So there has to be another, well, another circle saying that from ready, you can go on to the hard disk, right? So that is what the medium scheduler is doing. So from ready, it swaps out. So there's one more state that is missing. That is those that are ready, but they are what? On hard disk. The ready here, those that are in memory, that can move directly into running. But there's one more circle that's missing in the text. That is from ready, you should be able to move to the hard disk. That means that maybe there isn't enough space. And sometimes you can see this when you are running many programs. You open so many programs and all of a sudden things slow down. That means that things are no more just in memory. There, there are now things that are moving between memory and hard disk. And when that happens, there will be even more slow down. Because you, you click something, it will take a while for it to come up. Because it might have been shipped off to the hard disk. It has to be brought back before it can even get to run. Right. So those are some of the practical consequences you see when you're using computers. You're using many programs, then what? It starts to slow down. And also why memory is expensive. 
It's a resource everyone wants. Right? The more memory, the more things that you can run. Right? Okay, so are people cool? Everyone is cool. Okay. All right. So I'm going to review. Um, sorry. The swapping. This is kind of small. Okay. Let me see if I can. So continue with how the swapping happens. So this is competition between two processes, and the middle is when they are actually um, sort of running. So the things that are happening, so I will run. So if you have, process, there are two processes here, zero and one, and all of them would like to run. Right. But if for any reason whatsoever, so this is with the interrupt state, which is, let me just get, oh, move up, please. Move up. Okay. So whenever someone gets interrupted, so something has to happen. Some process has to happen. And what is going to happen when you're interrupted is your control block, uh, your control block, process control block, PCB. If you see PCB, that's what it means. Process control block. All the information about you, we have to what? We have to save it. We have to update that file. It's almost like saying, well, I'm speaking to you right now, and I'm going to speak to someone else. Your brains are very smart, and then they can sort of shelve the information you are working with so that what, when you come back to it, you can use it. But the first thing is it's going to save the state. And then save, saving the state that means any other information about you, your registers. Remember the PCB has everything about you. Right? So it's going to save it. And then we're going to pick somebody else. So the idol is someone who was in ready state, ready to go. But they said that he's, what, he's idle, he's just waiting. So his PCB is going to be loaded so that he can, what, he can run. But the moment there is another interrupt, that means that that person's state, so this is going to happen for many, many, many processes that now and then interrupt will happen. Your PCB, so anytime an interrupt happens, your process control block has to be saved. So that what? When you come back, you can continue. Because there's another process that is coming in to take over the whole CPU, including registers. So if we don't save the things you are working with, and we just what bring the other person in. We can't bring you back to continue exactly where you were. So the process control block has to save everything that you are working on. You are kicked out. The other person's process control block is brought, uh, brought in. And then what? Once it's brought in, the OS knows these are the files you have. This is your memory. Then you can execute. Anytime there's an interrupt, your process control block will have to be saved. Right. So this diagram was just illustrating switching between different processes. This is just two processes. But in reality, it happens for hundreds of processes that are happening within the operating system. Any questions? Okay, so this, um, you see this diagram, how do you do operating systems? Oh, uh, no, software engineering. You all are doing software engineering. Okay, so eventually you see this, this diagram. Right? And what it's, it's best for is, so there are some diagrams that, um, I don't know if you've seen some, like class diagrams. Class diagrams capture specific things. But this diagram captures what? Interactions, how things are interacting, especially also with the action. So she's asking, what is this PCB? So if you read it from top to bottom, so at the beginning, and you are capturing... You can have more than two things on this type of diagram, but you learn it in software engineering, where you are capturing a process, trying to describe what's going on. So from the top, process zero was executing, but process one was idle. An interrupt occurred. When the interrupt occurred, you had to save the state of the PCB of process zero. Right. As they saved, some other preparation could happen in terms of maybe the kernel coming to do some work. But eventually, it will have to what, load someone who was idle, like someone who was in the ready state. And that's why it has here that it's loaded. So you can see the arrow going through showing you this is like the process or the how things are working. Oh, there's no cursor. Okay. So this starting from the top, this is the process. So it's usually, you can use this to capture information very nicely. And you do this in software engineering. In other words, you're seeing that the work that is happening or the activity is going from one place 
to a place so the arrow follows but from the arrow you can tell where control is going so for software engineers the static diagram is nice having the classes but at some point this also explains to someone what has to happen right? and so what has to happen is starting from someone who is executing if an interrupt happens you move to the operating system who will then what save your state when he saves your state he'll do some other work and then what will load the state for process control block one that is the information about the process one right and then it's going to pass on control to process one and that one can now be what considered to be executing so it, its state has changed from ready it's written idle but ready it's executing when it gets to a point and there's another interrupt the control comes back to the OS. So these are all what, different processes. One for process control. Zero, process one, the OS. Save state. Once he reloads, then what? So he has to load your state before you get to run. But once he loads the state, he can pass control back to you. So if you have four, five, six processes, there will be arrows going what? Between the OS and others. So this is also a nice question I love to ask. To ask people to illustrate if you have two or three. Two is simple. I to do three. But it's just what? Showing the flow that from one, anytime there's going to work, interrupt, control has to go what? To the OS. He does his work. And then what? Will load, he has to load your process control block before what? It passes control to you. Okay, so. Yes. Okay. So he's asking a problem about sometimes you, you believe that you have all this, uh, maybe you have memory, you have CPU, and still your, your program is running slowly. Sometimes it's poorly written code. That can happen. Yes. Or sometimes there could even be an error somewhere that is causing the OS to stall or wait. Or sometimes they are competing for a resource. Right? It, could, it may not necessarily be memory, but let's say there's a file that everybody wants or has been using. Maybe there's a, some temporary folder. The moment that happens, so let's say you all, we all went to lunch, and there's enough food, it's all kinds of food, but there's this special dish that everyone wants, maybe... Uh, which one will take a long time? Red, red. Yeah, plantain and beans. It has to be fried. We want it fresh. We want the oil also fresh. Right? And so, if that happens, that means, yes, there are resources for everyone, but you are competing for something. The moment you are competing, that means there's going to be a queue. And the reaction you are seeing from the OS is actually what? The things that are running. For a human being, it's the things that are running that you are concerned about. And so, there's a queue of things waiting for this red, red. And one gets in, uses it, and another gets in. And if that happens, the OS would seem to be slow. But there may still be a lot of CPU, a lot of memory, a lot of hard disk. But just that if there's competition somewhere, it could be slowing down. So competition one, some error, right, could also be causing an issue. Yes, yes. So it happens a lot. So he's, he's pointing out that sometimes you click something, not just for uh, the browsers. Well, the browser is a common one. Maybe you have a browser open, and then all of a sudden it freezes, not responding. Sometimes it's, as I said, poorly written code. And some of the browsers these days are doing a better job. Some of them will ask you, do you want to kill this tab? I think Chrome does that. Or Firefox could ask you, should you prevent this uh, process from going on? And sometimes when you kill it, you realize you're playing a video, and the video is killed. Because it means that there's some code written somewhere that is forcing things to become slow. You can easily, um, you can easily make a web page. Don't do this to people, but they'll never visit your site again. A web page that has even a JavaScript loop. A simple JavaScript loop that is what? Spinning. Just while through open close bracket. That means that when someone visits that page, it's just going to a spin. And the whole, you can slow down a whole machine with that. Right. And for those who have not noticed, if you go to... Um, Windows, I think the power options, if you go in detail, drill down, you see something about JavaScript timing. Because some of the browsers have been sort of 
slowing people down. So you could have a browser window, I'm not saying don't visit websites, you could have a browser window with some JavaScript that is slow or doing something that is inefficient. And then all of a sudden, everything is what? Being slowed down, being pulled down. So if it can happen in the browser, you can see it can happen almost in any other program. That somebody's just one line, poorly written code, can what? Slow the whole system to a crawl. So it, it can happen for many reasons. And consequently, you can see some companies are now insisting that they vet applications that are going in their stores and so on. Just so that they can control the quality of things. Not saying that there aren't arguments for a free market. But someone can say, well, you can't install to my operating system until you bring in, you submit the code for review. We check it. Because it would be very sad if, let's say, you install this application and somehow start blaming Windows or Android or iOS. Meanwhile, when you bought it and it was fresh, it wasn't slowing down. But as other things are added on, the experience may change because some developer or some seller somewhere may have given you some piece of code that is slowing down everything. Not to say that operating systems can't make mistakes, but sometimes the, the developers or the sellers, the app makers, are also to blame. And that's why you see all these rules about submit your code, they review it, and sometimes they refuse certain applications to put things on the App Store or the Play Store and so on, just to make sure that you get good response. Okay, so this is process control block. This is the end, so I'll give, well, not the end of the class, but a temporary end, I'll give you five to ten minutes. I'm going to, um, the next step, so just so you rest a bit. Five minutes. Oh, so then, okay. Since it's time and we, we have to, okay, so what I'll do is,